Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you today is definitely a sad one. It's a case that definitely should not have gone down the way that it did and so many lives were ruined because of it. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Destiny, Jacqueline, Helena, and Lana for being a part of the Patreon family. Your support truly means the world to me and words could never express my gratitude. So from the very bottom of my heart, thank you so, so very much for your support. But with that being said, let's just jump right into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Mariah Wilson. Mariah Wilson, who went by Mo, was born on May 18th, 1996 in Littleton, New Hampshire to parents Eric and Karen Wilson, and she had a brother named Matthew. She grew up in East Burke, Vermont, graduating from Burke Mountain Academy in 2014, going on to Dartmouth College, graduating in 2019 with a degree in engineering. After that, she moved away from her hometown in Vermont and moved over to the Bay Area in California, going on to work as a demand planner for a bicycle parts company called Specialized. Mo was also described as a lifelong athlete. While in college, she was a member of the Alpine Ski Racing Team, which had been a lifelong dream of hers. She was described by those around her as being a dedicated student and a committed athlete. She was focused on skiing in college, but she had always had a love for biking, which grew early in her life. While skiing in college, she was ranked third nationally for her age in the giant slalom. During this time, she actually tore her ACL during her sophomore year. But that didn't stop her from being successful on her skiing team. But even then, three years after that, she tore her ACL again. But she used this adversity to work hard to rehab her ACL after her second injury. And during this time, she decided to pursue a new dream to become a professional cyclist. Now, when she was little, Mo spent many hours biking the Kingdom Trails, developing her skills and strengths in biking. After graduating from college, she decided to pursue her dreams of becoming a bike racer. She worked hard for two seasons and won numerous awards in mountain bike racing and gravel racing. Just before her death, with the support of her friends and family, Mo decided to quit her job and become a full-time professional bike racer. And with that, she moved back to Vermont. She once told her mentor, quote, When you love something so much to the point where you're fully committed, you make that choice and the risk sort of becomes irrelevant. Because even if you fail, it will all have been worth it. The process and all that comes along with that is more important and valuable in the end. But beyond this dream of bicycling, Mo had other ambitions. She wanted to give back and inspire others by hoping to create a community space in East Burke, Vermont, where other bikers could gather throughout the day and feel welcome and share some good coffee and good food. She was passionate about inspiring others to be active and promote a body positive awareness for women and female athletes in particular. Mo also enjoyed cooking, writing, and traveling with one of her favorite places being Italy. Now, by the fall of 2021, Mo had met a young man named Colin Strickland. He was also a professional cyclist who Mo had met during a four-day gravel race in Idaho. Colin was 10 years older than Mo at the time. She was 25, he was 35, but he had a lot of similar experiences to Mo. He too had quit his steady nine to five job to pursue professional biking, and it turned out to be very fruitful for him. He won a prestigious gravel race back in 2019, and he became an icon in the cycling scene. At that time, in October of that year, Colin was in the middle of a two-week breakup with a woman named Caitlin Armstrong. Caitlin was also a cyclist, but she wasn't quite a professional. She was more of an avid rider, so she couldn't necessarily keep up with Colin, but she really enjoyed biking and she enjoyed going with him. She was very physically fit and she did also work as a yoga instructor. So during the time, during the two week breakup, Mo and Colin began a very brief romantic relationship. The two had been intimate for about a week while Mo had been visiting Colin's hometown in Austin, Texas. After this brief time, Caitlin and Colin did get back together, so the relationship between Mo and Colin ended, and they went back to just being friends. 
But Caitlin knew about the brief relationship that the two had, and she was very, very upset by it, in my opinion, understandably. Caitlin blocked Moe's number on Colin's phone so that she wouldn't be in contact with him anymore. However, by May 11th, 2022, Mo had been visiting Austin, Texas again because she was preparing for a gravel race competition. While in Austin, Mo reached out to her friend Colin to see if he wanted to hang out. The two had been texting back and forth about the plans and Colin admitted that he changed Mo's name in his phone so that Caitlin wouldn't know that he was still talking to Mo. He also admitted that he had been deleting texts so that Caitlin wouldn't know any of the plans or anything that they had been talking about. Either way, Mo and Colin did decide to hang out that day and by 5.55 p.m., Colin picked up Mo and the two went for a swim at the city of Austin Deep Eddy pool together before they grabbed dinner at a nearby restaurant called Pool Burger. The two ordered some food and some cocktails together. However, during their dinner, Colin had been getting calls from his girlfriend, Caitlin. He knew that Caitlin wouldn't like that the two of them were getting dinner together and while they were getting food, Colin did ignore Caitlin's calls. After finishing their meals, Colin and Mo hopped on to Colin's motorcycle together and he dropped Mo off at her friend Caitlin Cash's Austin apartment. Because of the confusion with the name, the fact that they're both Caitlin's, Caitlin Cash is with a C and then Caitlin Armstrong is with a K. Either way, I'm going to call Caitlin Cash by her last name Cash and then I'm going to call Caitlin Armstrong as Caitlin. Either way, Colin dropped Mo off outside of the apartment across the street and Colin started driving towards home. Mo walked across the street and up the wooden stairs to the apartment where she used a code to unlock the door and settle inside. At that time, Cash had been out with her own friends getting dinner. Cash got a notification to her phone that someone had used the code to get inside of the home by 8.36 p.m. And at that point, she knew that Mo had made it home safely. Cash returned home from dinner at around 10 p.m. that night. But when she walked into her apartment, she found the worst possible case scenario imaginable. She found her close friend, Mo, laying in a pool of her own blood, unresponsive on the bathroom floor inside of the apartment. Of course, immediately, Cash frantically dialed 911 and started to begin CPR in an attempt to save her life. When police arrived, they found Mo lying on the ground face up. Next to her body, police found three bullet casings, which were marked as a 9mm JAG. They found that Mo had a laceration on her right index finger and another laceration on her chin. They found that she had been shot two times in her head and then a third time in her chest, which had exited through her back. That bullet would later be found lodged in the concrete tile beneath Mo's body, showing that whoever did this to her shot her while they were standing above her while she was already lying on the floor completely helpless. As police started their investigation, they actually found out that there was a neighbor of Cash's who actually had an external surveillance video that faces a driveway of the house right next to Cash's apartment. They saw that a dark colored SUV drove past the home with cameras right at 8.37 p.m., so one minute after Mo got home. Cameras saw the SUV slowing down and stopping right next to Cash's home. On that SUV, it was seen to have a large bicycle rack mounted on the trailer hitch, a luggage rack mounted on the roof, and there looked to be a chrome covering on all of the windows. This SUV turned out to be a 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee and it belonged to Colin. So, he was quickly taken into the police station and questioned. When he was being questioned, he admitted to police that Caitlin would have been upset if she knew about him and Mo getting dinner together. So, he lied about it to her. Texts on Colin's phone show that just after dropping off Mo, he texted Caitlin saying, Hey, are you out? Went to drop off some flowers for Allison at her son's house up north and my phone died. Heading home unless you have another food suggestion. Again, we see with that text message that he was lying to his girlfriend about what he was doing that evening. After sending that text message, Colin got back home to the house where he lived with Caitlin. He said that he went into his garage and started working on his bicycles to prepare for an upcoming race. 
By 9.21 p.m., he sent another text message to Caitlin. Not long after sending that text message, Colin said that Caitlin returned back to their home, driving Colin's 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee with the bicycle rack on the back and the luggage rack on the roof. Colin told the investigators that he didn't ever drive the Cherokee, that pretty much only Caitlin drove that car. Then police asked Colin if there were any firearms in the home. Colin said that him and Caitlin both had guns. Colin said that he was a very strong believer of women's safety. He was aware of the privilege as a man that he had that he was able to ride around on his bike without much fear of his physical safety, unlike most women who have to be in constant awareness of their surroundings so that they don't get attacked. Because of this, he purchased a Springfield Arms EMP 9mm handgun for himself and a Sig Sauer P365 9mm handgun for Caitlin. At first, police weren't wholly convinced that Caitlin was the one driving the Cherokee. They thought that it was possible that maybe Colin was driving. But they did end up finding surveillance video that showed Colin riding his motorcycle home along Interstate 35 at 8.48 p.m., eight miles away from where he dropped off Mo only 12 minutes prior. So it just didn't seem all that plausible that Colin would have had the time to shoot and kill Mo in that short period of time. So that evening, detectives found out that Caitlin had an outstanding warrant for her arrest in relation to other charges. So she was taken into the station for this warrant and she was questioned. She was told at the beginning of the interview that she was free to leave whenever she wanted because she wasn't taken in for anything related to the murder only for this unrelated warrant. But of course, they did question her about things related to this murder and about her whereabouts that night. Caitlin said that she was at home when Colin walked in and informed her that another woman in the cycling community had passed away. She said that she didn't know that Colin and Mo hung out that day or even that he had been talking to her or seen her at all recently. And she said that she did not know where Mo was staying in Austin with her friend. She had no explanation for why Colin's car was seen in the area at that time or why Colin said that she was the one who was driving it. So the detectives asked if maybe she was just hanging around the area because she was mad about Colin and Mo hanging out. And she said, yeah, maybe that's what happened. Detectives told Caitlin that things just were not looking good for her and she didn't really respond. They talked about how she was most likely driving the car that was seen right next to where Mo would later be found dead. How she was clearly upset about the two hanging out and that there was this motive for her to be upset and lash out at Mo. But the entire time, she sort of just nodded along and she didn't really say much. After being silent almost the entire time, Caitlin asked to leave the interview. It turned out that the arrest warrant that they had for Caitlin had been in error, so they couldn't actually hold her. So the interview ended and she left. Then others who knew Caitlin and Colin started to come forward to investigators to talk about the relationship between Mo and Colin. So like I said earlier, it was thought by pretty much everybody that the two were just friends. They had this little fling and then Caitlin and Colin got back together, so they completely called it off but decided to stay friends. But some friends started to say that Mo and Colin actually had more of an on-again, off-again type of relationship even while Caitlin and Colin were still dating. One friend said that Caitlin knew about the relationship going on behind her back and she was furious. She followed Mo on Instagram. She blocked her number from Colin's phone multiple times and even told a friend that she was so angry about it that she wanted to kill Mo. The friend said that she believes that it was after saying that she wanted to kill Mo that Caitlin had got that gun. But the friend said that she couldn't be sure. She said that the two were hanging out at a local bar and there was loud music and they had a couple of drinks, so she wasn't 100% sure if that's really what Caitlin was saying. The friend also said that she didn't think that there was any way that Caitlin was being serious if she did say that she wanted to kill Mo. 
The friend described that everybody who knew Caitlin knew her as a kind, caring, compassionate person, full of life, full of light, and full of talent. So to her, it seems like one of these, you know, offhanded comments that I'm sure people make all the time. I've said it, you know, I'm gonna kill them. Very upset with them, like that's gonna happen. Obviously, I never mean it, and I'm sure every single one of you watching has said that about somebody in your life when you're upset with them, and obviously, you don't actually kill anybody. So I'm sure that's what the friend was thinking at that time. Either way, this sort of back and forth relationship was seen in multiple text messages between Mo and Colin. So there was this event back in January of 2022 where Mo and Colin were both in Arkansas for an event. And of course, Mo and Colin saw each other. The first text that met the first text message that Mo sent Colin reads, quote, Hey, so would like to talk to you at some point. Had originally texted you on Friday, but it appears my texts aren't going through again. This weekend was strange for me, and I just want to know what's going on. If you want to be just friends, seems to be the case, then that's cool. But I'd like to talk about it, because honestly, my mind has been going in circles, and I don't know what to think. The following day, Colin responds with, quote, Hey Mo, I feel very shitty for putting you in position where you don't feel comfortable. Caitlin came along to the go-to meeting about the Sprinter Spartan Hotel project. In hindsight, this was not a good idea. So based on this, it is believed that Mo and Colin were still having some sort of relationship behind Caitlin's back. Then going back with the investigation, police were able to determine that the bullet casings from the gun used to murder Mo matched the gun that Caitlin owned, a Sig Sauer P365 9mm handgun. There have been questions around this and saying that it's like not true science, that it's not 100% a match, things like that, but obviously those things will come out more in trial as we hear more arguments with it. And finally, it turned out that Caitlin, Colin, and I believe Mo, but I'm not 100% sure if Mo also used it, but at least Colin and Caitlin used a tracking app called Strava, which is an app that allows bicyclists to track their route. That is how Caitlin was able to track Colin and find out that the story that he was telling his girlfriend was a lie. That is how he found out about how to find Mo. So by Tuesday, May 17th, 2022, six days after Mo's murder, Police felt that they had enough evidence to make an arrest and charge Caitlin with Moe's murder. But by the time they went to search for Caitlin, she was gone. And from there, an international manhunt began. As police started their search for Caitlin, they first needed to get a timeline of events that led them to realizing that she was gone. First, it came out that Colin had actually given Caitlin $450,000 in investment capital at one point. He had asked for all of it back, but she left before he could ever get it back from her. Then it turned out that Caitlin sold her car to a CarMax dealership on May 13th for $12,200, receiving the check just one day after being questioned by police. After that, she was seen on May 14th boarding a flight at the Austin airport from Austin to Houston, where she then took a connecting flight to LaGuardia Airport in New York City. Here, she was seen on surveillance video wearing a denim jacket and a black shirt with a pink design. So at this point, we know that she fled, she traveled across the country and has over $460,000 at her disposal. After Caitlin was seen at LaGuardia, she was then seen at an airport in Newark, New Jersey. However, there was no record of a flight in her name. And after that, she was gone. By June 23rd, Caitlin's Jeep was found after she had sold it. But then finally, by June 30th, 43 days after killing Mo, she was captured in Costa Rica. It turned out that Caitlin had actually used her sister's passport and her sister's name in order to book a flight from Newark to Costa Rica. She had been staying at Don John's Surf and Yoga Lodge, which is a hostel lodge in a small town called Santa Teresa. One witness who saw Caitlin said that she had been out asking people about how to get around cheaper when the police suddenly showed up during a routine check of the facility People around her at the yoga lodge said that she was going by the name Ari. But when the police showed up and saw Caitlin, they asked her to see her passport. But she told them that the passport was in a different hotel, so she didn't have it with her. Then she gave the officer a fake name, 
but no record of her entry into the country came up, so they got suspicious. Eventually, Caitlin did give up her real name, and that is when police discovered that she had an international arrest warrant out for her. Of course, after that, she was quickly arrested. When they found Caitlin, she had cut her long, reddish blonde hair short and dyed it dark brown. She had a bandage on her nose and bruising under her eyes. Initially, she told authorities that this was just an injury caused by a surfing accident. However, within the apartment where Caitlin was staying, investigators found some other interesting things. First, they found the passport that belonged to her sister. Then, they found a receipt for a payment of $6,360 for plastic surgery for someone named Allison Page that took place on June 23rd at a medical center in Costa Rica. Police later said that it appeared that Caitlin was trying to return to her old habits in a new area, she was trying to start teaching as a yoga instructor again. Staff at the yoga lodge said that she applied to work there as a yoga teacher many times, but they kept telling her no until eventually she started helping out with classes when the normal teacher was off. So if the normal teacher was out sick or on vacation, she would take over and teach those classes. Witnesses from the lodge said about Caitlin's behavior at the lodge, quote, she didn't talk to anyone. She didn't have to work in the morning and she slept late. When she got up, she drank a lot of coffee and she sat in some chairs apart from the others. They said that she would stay at the hostel all day and only left at night, returning back very late after the other guests were already fast asleep and she didn't really interact with anybody while she was there. Obviously, the assumption here is that Caitlin fled the country using her sister's passport and then it's thought that Caitlyn got plastic surgery and dyed her hair darker in an attempt to look more like her sister. I haven't been able to find any information regarding whether or not it's believed that her sister had true involvement, but I think it's pretty safe to say that Caitlyn wouldn't have been able to get her sister's passport without her knowledge. Whether or not she knew where Caitlin was staying or if she helped her in any other way than Caitlin using her passport, we don't fully know. I think I saw in one article that there were being charges pressed against Caitlin's sister, but that was just one source. I tried looking it up. I couldn't find it anywhere else. So if you guys know more about that, please let me know down below. Either way, Caitlin stood in front of the judge on July 20th where she pled not guilty to first degree murder. She was held in custody after being given a $3.5 million bail. And as of right now, her trial is scheduled for June of this year, 2023. So that is all I have for today's case. I think it's pretty cut and dry what happened here. Obviously, I do think that Caitlin is responsible. I think that she probably knew about the relationship going on behind her back the entire time. And obviously, it was very upsetting, and so I think she took that anger out on Mo, and this is what happened. She murdered her because of that. But I am really looking forward to the trial that comes of all of this and any new information that they're able to put forward for all of this and any arguments that they have, whether or not they're going to try to pin it on Colin, who clearly had an alibi, or if they're going to try to get some third party involved. I'm honestly really looking forward to all of that side of things. It truly is a very sad situation that does just break my heart. It sucks allegedly being cheated on, but man, some of you girls and guys do the most. If someone repeatedly cheats on you and expresses interest in someone else, especially if you're not married, you don't have any kids together, you don't have all that many ties, just break up with them. Like, I just don't get why women target and blame the other woman in the situation. She's not the one cheating. She's not the one that's, like, ruining your relationship. He is. He's the one ruining his own relationship. So, that doesn't make any sense. And obviously, vice versa. If the guy blames the other guy for cheating when his girlfriend cheats, like, obviously, both parties are responsible, especially if they both know that there's a third person involved. But, Man, just break up with someone if they're cheating on you. It really is that simple. You don't need to kill someone because now there is a woman who lost her life when she was just starting it. She was only 25. She was on the path to do such amazing things and it was cut short over jealousy. And now another woman is most likely going to jail and is probably going to lose her life 
because she got so jealous over her boyfriend who was seeing someone else behind her back when it could have just been solved with her breaking up with him and moving on. Then there's Colin, who I'm sure feels all of the guilt in the world. Obviously, once again, cheating is wrong. You shouldn't cheat on your partner. There's always a chance that your partner is going to lash out at you or the other person, and that's never okay. But there's no way that Colin could have predicted that something like this would happen. Obviously, his actions were very, very wrong if he did cheat behind his girlfriend's back, which it seemed like he did. But that doesn't mean that Mo or him deserved to have this happen, obviously. I think that's a pretty obvious statement right there. It is a sad case all around, especially knowing how much potential Mo had in her life. It truly is devastating. But that is where I'm going to end today's case. Again, I am really looking forward to hearing what comes of the trial, and when that does happen, I will keep you all updated on what comes of it. But with that, I am going to end this video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. I especially recommend following my Twitter because that is where I keep the most up to date with any recent case that I'm covering, including this one. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.